I still see people asking me about the Jesuits and if they have any power. I already told you about the Jesuits not having any power at all. 14 years ago, around 2010, in my videos. And I'll answer that once more and once and for all in a bit more extended version and connected to their counterpart, the Protestants, and how and why the Knights Templars founded Protestantism. So here you see, here it says Ignatius de Loyola and his castle. He was of the nobility. All this is related to the French king, Philip the Fair, who is a descendant of the Ukrainian princess Anne of Kiev, also called Anna Yaroslavna, who lived from 1030 to 1075 and brought the Gospel of Reims with her from the Ukraine, on which Philip the Fair took an oath when he became the King of France. So here you can see the original picture of Anna of Kiev, and this is the original book, the Gospel of Reims in France. Yes, the French kings took their oaths on a Ukrainian book in Cyrillic writing. Pharaoh's nobility only marries Pharaoh's nobility, for which no distance is too long. Like French King Henry I getting his wife as far away as Ukraine. And that's thousand years ago in the year 1050 as if there weren't any nice French girlies around. These are pure pharaonic bloodlines that hardly accept any mixing with those European tribe girls of the white slaves. So here you can see the French fleur de lis, and it's in the same color as the seal of the Ukraine. And I hope you all see it's in fact the same symbol. You've got three parts in this one, three parts in that one. And um, I explained it in a previous video about Putin, I think, that um, the origin of this here, it's all pharaonic. Therefore, 500 years later, the guy who invented Protestantism must have been a nobleman, because his wife, Katharina von Bora, was so too, of aristocratic origins, living in a castle. And on the other side was Ignatius de Loyola, the Jesuit, also a nobleman, also living in a castle. Because religion belongs to the nobility since pharaonic times and the priests of Amun in order to dominate the dumb slaves with religious hocus pocus. So behind religion, it is not some invisible god in the skies, but it is Pharaoh's worldwide nobility behind religion and basically owning religion. So here it says, Amenhotep, high priest of Amun. This is where it all started with. Also in Christianity, there is the internal fight in between the vertical rule and the horizontal rule. So here you see two churches, one is the Catholic and the other is the Protestant. And the Catholic, I suppose this side is the Catholic Church, it's the vertical Christianity versus the Protestant Church is the horizontal Christianity, which I will explain to you right now. 
Here it says Queen Cleopatra, 50 BC. And look at the fans. And look at the Pope here. And this is an original painting. The Pope Pius VIII. So it was a Pius. There were eight Pius Popes, maybe. And then there were ten, a bit less Pius, maybe. From 1830. So they really had these fans. You know, it's the same fan here as in ancient Egypt. Yeah? So, look, the Pope is traditionally on a throne, like a king, which is the OWO, feudal vertical rule, like Pharaoh's nobility. And here you can see the same old Pharaonic fans to call down Pharaoh and the Pope, because it all comes from ancient Egypt. That's why. There's this old pharaonic proverb, when the shit hits the fan. If you please permit me, an old pharaonic joke, still quite popular today in pharaoh's present day armies, it says, when shit hits fan. So these are the fans, this is the fan, and this of course is the piece of shit, you know, that needs to be carried and he's ruling the entire world. So here it says Vicarius Christi, which means God's substitute on earth. And the Pope's title is Vicarius Christi, which means the substitute of Jesus here on earth, which is in the religious sense of things as vertical as it can get, dealing with a bloke who is God's substitute on earth, being the one right after God. Therefore, Catholicism is a vertical rule Christianity, like in Pharaoh's time with the priests of Amun. Nothing has changed, really. So here it says, priest of Amun. Here you can see the bloke. And here, Vicarius Christi. Same thing, nothing changed. The Catholic Church is a vertical rule with a Pope at its head giving all the orders all the way down like a feudal king. And that's why Catholicism is the king's religion. And when a king orders the Pope to leave Rome, the Pope obeys. As it happened in 1309, when the French king Philip the Fair told the Pope to come to Avignon in France, so the king could better keep an eye on the Pope. Then the Pope stayed 67 years in France, where seven popes succeeded to live in Avignon, France. So here it says here, Avignon. He's going to the castle here. It was an, a real, it still is there, a real castle in 1309. He's the one of those seven popes of Avignon. And only upon return to Rome in 1376, the Pope started to reside at the Vatican, what never occurred before. So when a king orders the Pope around, and to leave his house and his country, then the Pope obeys. So here it says, the Pope's palace in Avignon, France, where near almost 100 years the Pope was living here. So this is the original building, which is still there, exactly like this. So to all you who believe that the Pope rules the world, like the Pope being the anti Christ and what not. Uh, let me tell you that this is all religious hocus pocus by some American Protestant fanatics in an internal religious war between vertical Christianity and horizontal Christianity. It says vertical Christianity versus horizontal Christianity. And Anyway, there is no Antichrist at all, as the Americans pronounce the name wrongly. 
The English pronounce it right, like Antichrist, but write it wrongly. So that's why I show it in French, because the French write l'antichrist correctly with an E and not with an I. An E from the word anterior, the guy that comes before the alleged real deal. The jaywalkers call that guy the Moshiach ben Yosef. So here it says the Pope kissing the feet of worldly leaders in Sudan 2019. So he's kissing the feet of some Nubians and worldly leaders, who of course are also of Pharaoh's nobility. And in fact, history teaches us that the Pope is way down in power compared to a medieval king, like for instance, in this case, the King of France, Philip the Fair. The Catholic Church hasn't any sorts of worldly power and never had any either. So you can imagine if this is happening today, then it also happened in the Middle Ages. So here he's kissing the feet of the Nubians. So you can imagine, you know, he was kissing the butt of every, the Pope was kissing the butt of every medieval king. And this is also a pink list killer thing in reality, you know. Um, it's like, shall I dominate you or are you going to dominate me? I already told you about this. In Italy, even any Catholic priest allegedly obeys the will of the Mafia, allegedly including the Pope himself, about which there are many rumours. Probably that's why today's Pope is trying to be friends with the pink list killers to have at least someone standing behind him in the vicious world of Rome where real friendships are as scarce as a divine miracle in hell. So here you can see about the rumors in the Vatican. You know, here's the, the real pharaonic obelisk. Here are the drugs and the money and the blood. And here you can see the Pope talking at the St. Peter Square with the pink lace killer. Well, I hope the Pope is um, only going to kiss his uh, feet. I there's also horizontal Christianity, which is the Protestant church, who don't have a single man on top, but they have a consistory, also called the Council of Elders, where a group of persons take all the decisions, thus making Protestantism a horizontal rule church. It says the consistory. Council of the Elders, Horizontal Protestantism. And these are original paintings and drawings here. This is from France of the consistory. Could this have to do with the Templars' horizontal and WO democracy of the Republic? Well, look. Here's the logo of the combined Protestant churches of France, which is in fact a Knight's Templar's cross, as you can see here. So here, I mean, look at the blue, which is definitely a cross of the Knight's Templars. And here it says, Église Protestante Unie de France, the United Protestant Church of France. So all the Protestant churches of France, they have this logo. And here you can see the logo of a, the Protestant Church of Belgium. It says, Église Protestante Unie, United Protestant Church of Belgium. And here's their website. It's not only one church, all the Protestant churches of Belgium, they all have this Templar's cross. And the Knights Templars, they made the horizontal rule, just as the, um, the Protestant Church, they have the horizontal Christianity of the consistory. And this bird 
must be, of course, Horus, because it's all from Egypt. And I showed you once that the Templars cross, they come out of, it comes out of a pyramid. And here you see the logo of the uh, Église Réformée de France, the Reformed Church of France, which is not only one church, it's, it's the United Reformed Churches of France. And Reformed, as we know, it's another word for Protestant. Look, it's, it's, it's a genuine Templar's cross, even in red. It's like the blood is still dripping off again with the, uh, with the bird. I mean, what bird is falling down like this? You know, that's only a falcon. That's not a pigeon or something. Wakey, wakey. Here you can see the logos of the, um, in the Caribbean or French territories. This one is Martinique. Templars cross with the diving bird, which is a falcon. A pigeon doesn't do this. And here another diving bird with another Templars cross of Guadeloupe. And these islands, they are next to the, uh, the island of St. James, where uh, Jeffrey Epstein, or Epstein, as some of you prefer to call him, where he was uh, having his island. And uh, St. James Island of Jeffrey Epstein, or Epstein, was a, a Templars island. I'm, I showed it in one of my videos. It belonged to the hospitalers, just as this here. You know? Diving bird. Well, Jeffrey Epstein also became a diving bird, so to say. And who exactly was that French king who ordered the Pope to come and reside in Avignon, France? And why that date of 1309? What happened in that era? Well, two years prior, to the Pope being ordered to France in 1309. In 1307, this very same French king, Philip the Fair, rounded up the Knights Templars in France on that Friday the 13th, and he roasted them in front of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Seven years later, in 1314, while the Pope was still in Avignon, France, obeying the King. So here you see the Templars being roasted. Here you see the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral behind it, because that's where it happened. Here you see it burning, you know, a thousand years later, or something like that. Uh, the Templars were arrested on 1307, so you have to relate the years. That's very important. Then the Pope got kidnapped in 1309, two years later. And the Templars got roasted in 1314, five years after that, by the same French king, Philip the Fair. So you have to see the relation through the dates, that these are all related events. And this is why, in this case, the dates are very important. Same king, same era. Could that be the reason for the Pope to leave Rome and come to France for almost a hundred years? Hell yeah, of course it is. So here you see the, the Templar dudes, and here it says, King Philip the Fair arrested the Knights Templars in 1307 and kidnapped the Pope only two years later, in 1309. Of course, these were related events, almost at the same time and by the same king. And as it was not the king attacking the Templars, but rather the Templars wanting to eliminate the King of France in order to install their new horizontal rule, they knew that the King was too strong, having his army all over the Empire. So the Knights Templars started to sabotage a little bit here and gnaw off a little bit there in order to gradually weaken the King of France. And so they decided to attack the King's Catholic religion. And when the King 
can just order the papacy around while moving the entire Catholic religion from A to B, this literally means that the Catholic Church belonged to the king. So it says the Pope's palace in Avignon, France. It is therefore that the king's religion has an equally vertical rule system, just as the feudal nobility of Pharaoh itself. This is the true essence of Catholicism. It says the papal hierarchy of the vertical rule Christianity of the Catholic Church. Whereas Protestantism has a Knights Templar horizontal rule by the Council of Elders in the Consistory. It says the Consistory Council of the Elders horizontal Protestantism. So the king knew through the torture of 325 Templars arrested in 1307 that the Knights Templars wanted to kidnap the Pope in Rome and bring him to Switzerland, just recently founded by the Knights Templars 16 years earlier in 1291. So here you can read Templar Safe House in Switzerland, 1291, found it. Templars arrested 16 years later in 1307 and then burned seven years after that, 1314. The Pope kidnapped to Avignon, 1309. So in this short period, because like 20 years, that, that's nothing in the Middle Age. It's like half an hour, like today. So this is all related. So the founding of Switzerland is related to the kidnapping by the French king of the Pope to Avignon and the arrest of the Knights Templars 16 years after Switzerland was founded. So they were all sitting comfortably in Switzerland. Nothing could happen to them anymore. The French king, therefore, brought the Pope to France to keep an eye on him, whereas today the Templar's Swiss Guard are there to keep an eye on the Pope and not to protect him but to survey him. Because in fact the Vatican since 1506 belongs to the ones who invented Protestantism, which got invented only 11 years later in 1517, when Martin Luther declared his 95 Theses on the Church of Wittenberg in Germany. So it says, the Swiss Guard, they were founded in 1506. Only 11 years later, Protestantism was invented in 1517. So here you see the grim Swiss Guard. And this guy is obviously, he's a prisoner of these ones here. So it needed to control the Vatican in order to launch and to start Protestantism in 1517. So only 11 years later, they had it all ready. You know, the Knights Templars with their Swiss Guard, they got control over the Vatican and the Pope and then they could start Protestantism. It's not a coincidence that these dates, because it's only 11 years, which is absolutely nothing in the Middle Ages, you know, that these dates so closely near to each other, that it, all these historical dates, you know, it's all related. The things happening, it's all related. Protestantism is related with the Swiss God taking control of the Pope and the Vatican. As the Templars didn't immediately succeed in kidnapping the Pope, they decided to just simply create a new Christianity in order to weaken the King of France and gradually 
nor at the king's pillars of power, which in fact it did immensely. So here it says, 1517, Protestantism was invented, the horizontal rule Christianity. Here you can see Martin Luther at the church of Wittenberg in Saxony, Germany. So the next king of France, Francis I, only 23 years after the birth of Protestantism, founded in Paris the Jesuits in 1540 at the French Sorbonne University by the Frenchman Pierre Favre as a countermeasure against Protestantism. Eventually, the Spanish Basque nobleman of Ignatius de Loyola took all the glory of being the founder of the Jesuits and making it look like a Spanish organization, where in fact they were originally French. But well, those Jesuits had no chance at all against those powerful Templars. Moreover, as the Jesuits never have been an army, but rather just a theological group inside the King's Catholic Church. So it says, Ignatius de Loyola, so that means he's a, an aristocrat of the nobility, de Loyola. Loyola is the place where his castle was. And so it, it says Ignatius from Loyola. And uh, here he is. And this is what his castle looked like. So here it says Jesuits, they were founded 1540 by Pierre Favre at the Sorbonne University of Paris, which I think is the oldest university in the world, or at least one of the oldest. And if you look at the name Sor, that is Sar, that means the king, Pharaoh, like the king of France, and Bonne. It's actually feminine, maybe because the word l'université in French, it's feminine probably. And so it means the good king, Sorbonne. And there, 20, there was 23 years after Protestantism was founded in 1517. So usually the dates... You know, it's boring, they don't have much significance. But in order to understand things, which they never teach you in school, of course, it's just boring dates, you know, and boring numbers. It's, you know, it's important to relate the, uh, the events that there is a connection. So this is definitely the connection, you know, 1517 Protestantism. And 23 years later, all of a sudden, Jesuits, you know. So it's all connected, you know. And 23 years, you know, in the Middle Ages, that's practically nothing. So this is definitely a countermeasure, which is a, a known fact, actually. It's an historical fact anyway. That, you know, the Jesuits were founded as a countermeasure against the Protestants by the king, of course, and that's why it was founded in Paris, in France. It has nothing to do with the Spaniards. Nothing to do, you know. They're just, they're just hiding things, you know, so, you know, just, just shove it on the Spanish, you know, so they did it or something. It was about the French king, you know. I mean, this must be clear by now. If you want to understand history and politics, you must leave religion out of the equation because religion is just a distraction and religion is owned by our pharaonic masters anyway. I recently explained to you in this video here on my other channel, Homeland Security, that 
if you want to understand the Middle East crisis, then forget about religion and concentrate on the local nobility. And this is the same with Jesuits versus Protestants, where you'd better concentrate on the nobility around and the nobility behind and the nobility within. Like Donald Trump being of royal nobility, just like Ignatius de Loyola of the Jesuits, and Trump going to the Jesuit Fordham University, which doesn't mean that Trump is a Jesuit, but it rather means that Trump is of royal descent, which of course he is. And what I've shown you in this video five years ago. So here's the t here's on my other channel, Homeland Security. Here's the title: Pharaoh Trump genealogy blood ties to killery global king aristocracy master over U.S. slaves. And here you can see him doing the same Freemason thing here, just like Adolf Hitler. Actually, it was me like 13 years ago that found Hitler doing this. And um, oh, now I can find it back maybe on my channel that was taken off. And um, so in this video, you'll find uh, the genealogy, the royal genealogy of Donald Trump. From his mother, his Scottish mother's side, how he's related with the Queen of Denmark and the King of Norway. And this is why he was in a Jesuit university. Because the Jesuits were founded in the Royal Sorbonne University of Paris, France, you know, by the French king. And um, this is what it was all about. Well, here it is. I'm awfully glad it's back again. You know, I made this, I found this 12 years ago. So look it up, go, go look it up yourselves, you know, because now we see all these politicians doing it, you know, like Trump and Erdogan and Merkel from Germany, all of them. And he already was doing it, you know. So this is very important. And look, he's putting his hand away, you know, like a Freemason, like um, Hermann Göring. So the video is um, here on my channel that was taken off and miraculously just back after seven years. So you see, I, I made this video in 2012. And it is 23 minutes, so go and watch it because there's some more interesting things in it. Yeah. So you just saw him doing the same hand as Mr. Trump. You know, it's all the same bunch putting us in world wars. You know, so here it says about the Jesuits, and I just scroll down a little bit. You can find the rest yourself. And here it says on August 15th, 1534, Ignatius of Loyola, a Spaniard from the Basque city of Loyola, and six others, mostly of Castilian origin, all students at the University of Paris, met in Montmartre outside Paris in a crypt beneath the church of Saint-Denis, now Saint-Pierre de Montmartre, to pronounce promises of poverty, chastity and obedience. Ignatius' six companions were Francisco Javier from Navarre, and here it says Peter Faber, you know, also called Pierre Favre, a French guy. And he was the guy who actually, you know, founded the Jesuits. There we go. 
it says uh, Pierre Favre, the Jesuit priest. And F uh, Favre, he was born in 1506. Uh, I think that was the date the um, the Swiss guard was founded to a peasant family in the village of Viare in the Duchy of Savoie. Now Saint Jean de Sixth in the French department of Haute Savoie. He was French, of course. It, it was a French organization. It was in the French University of uh, La Sorbonne in Paris, and it was the French king. You know, having a problem with the um, with the Templars and the Protestants and etc. So the whole organization was French. In 1819, this fantastic castle of Javier was given to the Jesuit order by the Duke of Villa Hermosa because the Jesuit order consists of the OWO vertical rule of Pharaoh's feudal nobility. I mean, why would a Spanish duke just give away his castle to a religious order. You know, why, why would he do this? Look at this magnificent castle, especially in those days. You know, well, because the Jesuits, it is um, aristocratic. It's a, it's, it's a noble organization against the Knights Templars. Of, it's, it's an organization by the feudal nobility. And here you can read it. It says here, the castle of Javier. And in the 1890s, the castle was donated by its owner, Duquesa de Villa Hermosa, to the Jesuit order, which intended to turn it into a missionary center. You know, it's so obvious, you know. Would the nobility give you a castle just like that? You know, they only marry with each other. They only give things to each other. And this is another example of it. So, please, just leave religion out of the whole equation. Both Catholic, both Islam, both uh, Protestantism, all of it. Just leave it out of the equation because you're not going to understand anything. It's just a distraction. So, here it says IHS of the Jesuits. And which apparently stands for Jesus Hominum Salvator. And here it says Isis Horus Set, also IHS. So I'll let you think for yourselves what you want to think. So the IHS of the Jesuits stands for Jesus Hominum Salvator, meaning Jesus, Savior of man. But you might also read Isis, Horus, and Seth, which is probably practically the same. As Jesus is traditionally being depicted with the sun behind his head, just as the winged sun disk of Horus. So here you see the Egyptian stuff, the falcon god with the sun. Here as well, one more time. And this is Jesus, also with the Son. They're both the Son of God, as they say. And here's the Swissy, protecting it all. The Jesuits call themselves soldiers of Christ, which is just a comparison and shouldn't be taken literally, as there never, ever, existed any Jesuit armies. So here you see Isis with her son Horus. This is Maria with her son Jesus. And here you see the Jesuit Pope. And this here, it looks like, you know, where you can lit a candle here, you know, for the eternal light maybe or something. As a nobleman, Ignatius de Loyola, of course, didn't even believe in God or Christ. But as a nobleman, he just didn't want to lose the nobility's vertical rule religion 
as a tool to manipulate the dumb commoners or to mobilize the dumb European slaves to go into battle to defend Christianity and die for Christ or Horus, where in reality they were dying for some aristocratic warlord against another aristocratic warlord. So here it says, all wars are by and for Pharaoh's nobility and have nothing to do with God, Jesus, Allah and the rest of Pharaoh's religious hocus pocus. This is why the nobility couldn't lose their Catholic religion to that Protestant Templar religion because then the commoners would fight for another warlord and die for another Christ. Therefore, the nobility mobilized the already existing French Jesuits by Pierre Favre to use them as a religious tool for the Counter-Reformation. And here you see Ignatius de Loyola, the Jesuit. And here it says, Jesuit nobleman Ignatius de Loyola presenting himself as Jesus with Horus Sundisk. Here, this is the Horus Sundisk. You still don't believe that we're being ruled by a bunch of pharaohs? Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, was married to Katharina von Bora of the German nobility, and from her mother's side, from the powerful duchy of Zagan, with a Templar's cross in their coat of arms, and also the crescent moon of Islam, which you can see in the Wikipedia's German version only. So here you can see her husband, you know, hammering the uh, the thesis on the church of uh, Wittenberg. And here it says, the Duchy of Zagan. And you look at the claws. There are eight red claws, so eight for octagon. It's full of Templars things here. And then here, the Templars cross and the crescent moon of Islam. Now, do you remember what I filmed last year in that Alsatian town with exactly the same thing, only the crescent moon bending down? But that's the same thing. You remember? Shall I show you? Now, here you can see it. This is the same uh, symbol, the same coat of arms as you just saw in the coat of arms of the Duchy of Zagan, of the wife of the founder of Protestantism. Only the crescent moon was up, but that's exactly the same thing. You know, so, and I explained here in this video, which you should see again, or if you haven't seen it before, you know, what I'm, well, just watch the whole video. It's only 40 minutes. And, you know, the Knights Templars, they had a an alliance with the leaders of the no, the nobility of Islam, and this is also one of the reasons that they're all here. You know, so here's the title; it's in the same channel, and I made this last year in June. No, two years ago. So. Open up your eyes, you know, because they use the same symbols and the same coat of arms, and it, it all has a meaning. And if you can connect it, you can understand what's going on. So right after, i show you one more time the uh, coat of arms of the Duchy of Zagan. So this actually means not only the Templars, Protestantism is not only connected to the Knights Templars, but also to Islam, which I already explained to you, because the uh, the nobility in the Orient, some of them, they want the horizontal rule. And that's why they had like Saladin, you know, the Sultan of Egypt. 
and he was in fact uh, part of the uh, of the Knights Templars. He was part of an order. I already made a film about this on my channel, Homeland Security. So, and another part, they wanted a the vertical rule. So there's definitely a uh, a connection between Islam, the Knights Templars, and Protestantism, which I I have already explained in my former videos why. And how? So here's Katharina von Bora. This is in English. You have to go to the German one here, Deutsch. And then scroll down here. And here it is. Fürstentum, Fürstentum Sagan. So her from her mother's side just there it is so here it said this before uh fürstentum sagan and danach war katharina wohl die tochter she katharina was the daughter of uh, johann von bora there was a father of Lippendorf and his wife Margarete, who came from a lower lower Silesian family, the um, the Duchy of uh, Zagan. So there you go. Katharina von Bora was a Cistercian nun. And the Cistercians are the predecessors of the Knights Templars. And the Knights Templars were founded not in Jerusalem, 1118, but three years before, in 1115, at the Cistercian Clairvaux Abbey by Bernard de Clairvaux, a Cistercian monk and son of a Burgundy Duke. So here you see the Cistercians in their white robes. Here it says Cistercians founded 1098 by Bernard de Clairvaux, only three years after the start of the Crusades in 1095. So the Crusades started 1095, Three years later, they found the Dislot here. So you can understand it had to do with the Crusades. So a so-called peaceful monk order, you know, they were founded three years after the beginning of the Crusades. Well, you must understand they were founded with a reason. And the reason is connected to the Crusades about which I will tell you more in a minute. So here it says, Katharina von Bora. There she is again, nobility. And here, at the age of nine, she was moved to Nimshen Abbey, Cistercian community. And named Marian Throne, Mary's Throne, near Grimma, where her maternal aunt was a nun. Von Bora's presence is in the financial accounts of 1509. After years of being a nun, Von Bora became interested in the growing reform movement and grew dissatisfied with cloistered life. Conspiring with several other sisters, she contacted Luther and begged for his assistance. So apparently she got uh, influenced at the Cistercian uh, monastery the Nimption Abbey so and this is quite logical because uh, it has all to do with the Knights Templars because the um, Cistercians are the predecessors of the Knights Templars and they wanted a horizontal uh, Christianity so here we can read about the Cistercians the Cistercian order here is their, their logo. You all see a lot of fleur de lis, that means the French nobility. And of course, um, you know, it was all 
religion is by the nobility. Bernard de Clairvaux. He was of the nobility. I'll show you that here. So they were founded in 1098, only three years after the beginning of the crusade. So that was not a peaceful monk's order, you know. It was meant for war, you know, crusades. And, uh, and here is the founder, Bernard de Clairvaux. De in French, it's of. So let's have a look here. And actually, Bernard de Clairvaux, he was really the biggest like uh, hero for Martin Luther. You know, he read all his books. And so it's quite clear where he got his ideas from. You know, Martin Luther, he got his ideas from Bernard de Clairvaux. And this is the guy who founded the Knights Templars. You know? It's all related from all sides, from his wife's sides, from everywhere. And it's all nobility. This guy is nobility. Yeah, It's not in the English, you know. Bernard's parents were Teslin de Fontaine. You know, high nobility. And Lord of uh, Fontaine Les Dijon. And at Adlet de Montbard, you know, his mother, both members of the highest nobility of Burgundy. You know, it's all nobility. I show you the castle where he was where he was brought up in, you know. So here the language it's not in the English side, so I have to go to the French one. There we go. Look, there it is. That's the castle where the founder of the Cistercians and the and the Knights Templars, you know, where he was brought up. This is where he was brought up, you know, in a real castle. Just like the wife of um, Martin Luther and Martin Luther himself. I'll show you that. It's all nobility. Religion is a tool by the nobility. So here it says, uh, Maison Natale de Saint Bernard. So it's the uh, it's it's where he was born and raised. So so here you can see the castle where Bernard de Clairvaux was born. I told you so that religion belongs to the nobility, and this is the high nobility of Burgundy. So here is the. Uh, the family name of uh, the mother of uh, Bernard de Clairvaux, so de Montbard, nobility, André de Montbard, and that was his uncle. Here it says, André de Montbard was the fifth Grand Master of the Knights Templar and also one of the founders of the order. The Montbard family came from the high nobility in Burgundy, and André was an uncle of Saint Bernard de Clairvaux, uh, being a half brother of Bernard's mother, Alette de Montbard. You know, so, if I look here in French, there's a little bit more. Uh, like here are the other members who founded the Knights Templars here, Hugues de Pin and Godefroy de Saint-Omer. Remember where the word, where the word Omerta, Omerta is coming from, because the Mafia is all by the, by the Knights Templars. I made that video about it. So this is actually, I'm talking here about the, the base of the, um, the Reformation, about Protestantism. This is where Protestantism got born. And if you don't understand history and the dates, you know, you will never understand what Protestantism is. You know, and it's all by the nobility, just as Catholicism. It's just the internal war between the, uh, the reds and the whites, you know. So here's the castle of André de, de Montbard. And this is where the mother of Bernard de Clairvaux, where she... Uh, where she was brought up, you know. And it's all related to Protestantism. This here, another castle, related to Protestantism. You know, it's nothing by the people. It's nothing, uh, it has nothing to do with God, Jesus, or Allah, or, or, or whatnot, you know. 
That's all religious hocus-pocus. It's all about Pharaoh's nobility and using it as a tool to manipulate us and to, to wage war amongst the peoples. So here the site about the Knights Templar. And I just want to show you about André de, de Montbar. Yeah, I'll read it for you. The impoverished status of the Templars didn't, didn't last long. No, it didn't. They had a powerful advocate in Saint Bernard de Clairvaux, a leading church figure. The French abbot primarily responsible for the founding of the Cistercian Order of Monks and a nephew of André de Montbard, one of the founding knights. Bernard put his weight behind them and wrote persuasively on their behalf in the letter in praise of the new knighthood. That's what... Bernard de Clairvaux, he wrote, eh? So he's he's about a knighthood, you know, and I, he's presenting himself as a monk. I mean, what's this? And in 1129, at the Council of Troyes, he led a group of leading churchmen to officially approve and endorse the order on behalf of the church. With his formal blessing, the Templars became a favored charity throughout Christendom receiving money, land, business, and noble-born sons from families who were eager to help with the fight in the Holy Land. Well, it was not about fighting in the Holy Land. It was getting the, um, the pharaonic treasures and get them into Switzerland, which was the, uh, the Templar's treasure. So I tell you once more, because this is very important, that it's the Reformation, Protestantism, Knights Templars, religion. It's all about castles, pharaohs, pharaohs, nobility, you know, whatnot. So André de Montbar, son of a count and born in this castle here of Montbar, was one of the original founders of the Knights Templars together with Hugues de Pin and Godefroy de Saint-Omer. And this was the uncle of uh, Bernard de Clairvaux. And also the mother of Bernard de Clairvaux, she uh, lived in this castle and was probably born there as well. And this all leads a bit further in history. It all leads to Martin Luther the Reformation and Protestantism. So this is Protestantism. It's castles and lords and pharaohs. That's what it is. It's just as Catholicism. And here, Bernard de Clairvaux, and apparently Martin Luther, he wrote, he read all the works of uh, Bernard de Clairvaux, and here it says, Martin Luther quoted Bernard, uh, Bernard de Clairvaux, several times in support of the doctrine of sola fide. So here on Martin Luther, I'll show you that he was basically living in castles, just as his wife and just as his big hero, Bernard de Clairvaux, near the Wartburg Castle. Uh, Luther's disappearance during his return to Wittenberg was planned. Frederick III had him intercepted on his way home in the forest near Wittenberg by masked horsemen impersonating highway robbers. They escorted Luther to the security of the Wartburg castle of Eisenach during his stay at Wartburg, which he referred as My Patmos. That's a monastery in Greece, you know, high up monastery, just as this one here. So, all these guys basically living in castles, it's all nobility. Martin Luther living here, his wife in a castle, and Frederick III. Well, and here, further down, I'll, I'll do it a bit quickly because. Otherwise, this takes too long. Here, he's, he's uh, anti jaywalker, he's really a lot. And this later on, you know, 
in the Nazi period, Luther had a big influence on the Nazis concerning the jaywalkers. And if you see the relation to Bernard de Clairvaux, you know, founding the Knights Templars and all that, you really see the connection here uh, to the word the Nazi Templars, also in relation to Martin Luther. They, are, they were and they still are the Nazi Templars. As only the firstborn son could get the castle and become the Lord, the rest went into the monasteries and founded the Republican horizontal rule inside of the Cistercian order. The Cistercians were the only monastic order that could carry a sword legally by a papal decree. So it just needed to paint or sew a red cross on the Cistercian white cloak and voila, the rapid transformation from innocent monk to brutal Templar was done. And they are the ones who founded Protestantism. So here are the Cistercians, they just needed to paint a red cross on their cloak and they're already carrying a sword underneath the cloak. And voila, they were the Knights Templars. In medieval times, people didn't have any surnames and only the nobility had long surnames, mostly related to the land and area they owned and ruled over. This means that Martin Luther was of the nobility, just as his wife Katharina von Bora was. So it says Katharina von Bora, nobility, they had surnames, and Martin Luther, it means he was of the nobility and his surname is originally of the nobility, which I'm going to show to you right now. It was more or less Napoleon who made family names compulsory in Europe. So he see him hiding his right hand everywhere. Napoleon, and here it says Napoleon's hidden Freemason hand. Martin Luther's father's family name was Luda, which you can see here, where his name originates from Ritter Wiegand von Luda, meaning the Knight Wiegand von Luda, nobility. So here it says, I can only find this in German, it says here, the father, the father of Martin Luther. There you go. And he came from the, um, his ancestor is Ritter Wiegand von Luther, from the nobility dynasty von Luther, aus from Großen Luther. This is a, a place in Germany. So this is the father. Well, he's got the same like nose as Martin Luther. And this is the, that Großen Luda. So it's like here in the middle of Germany. And so here, Yeah, so I'll go back to this one here. And here, this is interesting, I'm going to talk more about it, that they moved to Eisleben. This is where uh, Martin Luther was born. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. So here, once more, the dynasty of Martin Luther, called Großen Luda, 
with this coat of arms here. And here it says, I say it in German, Der Ritter Wiegand von Lüda wäre das Vorfahr des Reformators uh, Martin Luther angesehen. So the knight Wiegand von Lüda is an ancestor of Martin Luther. Well, how could it be otherwise, you know? So here it says some more in English that uh, Martin Luther, his father, was his name was Luda or Ludher, and that his ancestry was um, the knight Vigant von Luda from the nobility, as they all are. You know, it's all nobility. Anyway, the nobility only Mary's nobility. And Martin Luther was practically living in his friend's castles, like here, the Wartburg castles. Here it talks about Luther, the Wartburg castle. So here you can see that he was practically living in castles, just as his wife. This is about the castle here. Yeah, the place where Martin Luther translated the New Testament of the Bible into German. Well, what do you know? Eh? It's all nobility. It, it is not about religion. You know, forget about religion. It has nothing to do with history, with the real history of things. So there's the castle again. And in German, if you would say someone is from the nobility's house of von Bora, as Martin Luther's wife, Katharina von Bora, you might say that the person is a Bormann, especially in the Middle Ages. They would just say that the European slaves, they would just say, you know, this is a Bormann which immediately made me think of the mysterious Nazi Martin Bormann, who was born in Wegenleben, Saxony, which is only 15 kilometers away from where Martin Luther was born in Eisleben. Here's a comparison between Martin Luther and Martin Bormann, who except for the tip of the nose, maybe, have no similarities. But there's something in the eyes and the overall intensity in the expression that might give a feeling of famili familiarity or bloodline. Because all these powerful peoples, it's all about bloodlines and dynasties, you know. So here it says, the two Martins, uh, their names are both Martin, Martin Luther and Martin Bormann. And this guy, he just disappeared. Nobody ever heard anything of him again. And he was the finance minister. So, you know where the money is, that's what the nobility does, and the Knights Templars, of course. And this guy here, he's related to the Knights Templars through Bernard de Clairvaux and the Cistercians and his wife. And this Nazi is also connected to the Templars through the Nazi Templars. And the, the Nazis did the very same thing, you know, just killing, murdering, raping, and accumulating a lot of wealth. So this is all in Saxony, and here on the left side you see Martin Luther von Bora, and on the right hand side the Nazi Martin Bormann. And Martin Bormann, he was born in Wegeleben, what you can see here, you know, it's encircled like and with a little bit of red. Here is the Halberstadt, here is the Leipzig, and Mart uh, Martin Luther, the other Martin, was born in Eisleben, where he died as well. He is the Halberstadt, here Leipzig. And from Eisleben to Wegenleben, that's only 15 kilometers. You know, that's nothing. I mean, Germany is, is a big country, eh? 
And south of Leipzig, here, Lippendorf, that's where Katharina von Bora, where she, where she came from in, the, in her castle. And about a, bit, a little bit north of here, almost between Magdeburg and Leipzig, a little bit to the right, there is Wittenberg, the church where he put the 95 theses, you know. So it's all in the same area. And I mean, from Bormann to von Bora, I mean, the ancestors, the descendants of Martin Luther, they were also von Bora from his wife's side. You know, so von Bora to Bormann, it was only 15 kilometers. So, of course, there's a connection, you know. It's still the same bloodlines. It's still the same dynasties, you know. Um, the last thing I did in the army, actually, another army, it was not, well, I can't tell you. Um, um, I was doing this, you know, looking into the intel, you know, going, looking for tangos and see where they came from, the ancestors and the, where they were born, the friends and the relatives and people they might have known, places they might have gone to, you know, to track them, you know. So... I'm using my uh, my knowledge here, what I learned, like a little bit, like tracking these guys in history, you know. So here you can see there is the aristocracy of called Bormann, like Martin Bormann, the Nazi. So it's called die Herren, you know, the uh, die Herrenrasse, you know, the... Uh, the superior race, the master race, the Herren von Kessel, genannt Bormann. And this, the G-E-N, it means uh, genannt Name, Vulgo Name. It's the name the, like the people gave to these persons, like von Bora, they call them Bormann, you know. It's exactly what it explains here. I can show it a bit more. Um, yeah, well, you can look it up yourself. And this is interesting. They have, um, here's their coat of arms, you know, with these arrows here. It's like the whites against the reds, you know, the horizontal rule against the vertical rule. I mean, it's already in their coat of arms, and this is what it was all about. And, of course, a lion. So, Bormann, Martin Bormann, you know, the Nazi who disappeared, well, he is of the nobility. They all were. They all are, you know. Luther has this pharaonic Y forehead, which Bormann doesn't. You see, I call it the Y forehead because, like, the nose, it's real broad here, you know. And it's not really a for the forehead is different if you compare to this is more European actually, but okay after so many generations you know you you, you don't know anymore, and this is like a Y you know like it's going apart so I call it a Y forehead. Also, his wife Katharina von Bora has a Y forehead, and this very long aristocratic nose. You know, she also has like a Y, you know, it's really like going apart and very long nose, like Putin, he has that as well. And this is something many of these pharaohs have. Just look at it. They, they got a Y forehead, you know, it's like the forehead is, it's going over into the nose, like, I don't know what it is, you know, but it, um, many of these pharaohs have this, but well, the 400 years difference between Luther and Bormann are about 20 generations, which is a lot of mixing. So with all this, it is very clear that the nobility rules over both Catholicism and Protestantism, which is just part of that difference in between the vertical rule and the new horizontal rule.
And there's not only the vertical church of the vertical Christianity and the horizontal church of the horizontal Christianity, but there's also the vertical Jesus and the horizontal Jesus. So here it says the vertical Jesus. You can see he's like hanged up vertically and here he's lying down it says here the horizontal jesus mostly we see the vertical jesus vertically on the cross but there's also the horizontal jesus anyway the cross itself has a vertical pole and a horizontal bar because rome was a republic thus horizontal rule for the bar and mr henry here was a jesus of nazareth rex judea the king of the jaywalkers which is a vertical rule and there are three crosses for the freemason concept of three and the cross itself has a 90 degree angle for the freemason concept of four. So for all our initiated pharaonic masters, this image here reads square and compass. So you see there are three crosses here, and this here is 90 degrees, which is a square. So the square is here, yeah? And I explained to you in my videos that the concept of three, here it says concept of three and four, it represents the compass. I'll explain it one more time because um, the, uh, the compass in the logo square and compass of the Freemasons, it's about 60 degrees. So with 60 degrees, you can make a, a unilateral triangle with three corners of 60 degrees or three sides, which is the concept of three. It's also a side of a pyramid, whereas the square, with a square you can make, um, well, a square with four, with four corners of four sides, which is also the base of a pyramid, where, that's where the slaves are. Whereas the concept of three, the side of a pyramid, it's the hierarchy, the hierarchy of our masters, and that's them. So the concept of three is the compass, and this is a square. So it says square and compass for our initiated masters. And here it says, uh, Jesus, king of the jaywalkers. I cannot pronounce their, other, their name because of the censorship. And Inri, it means Jesus Nazareth Rex Judea. That's Jesus, in the, like in, uh, in Latin, they wrote uh, G, the, uh, an I for a J. Uh, I, I should have written another I here, but never mind. And uh, Rex, it means king. So it says Jesus of Nazareth, the king of, the, uh, of Judea. And this is the vertical versus the horizontal rule. So this is the vertical rule here. And this here is the horizontal rule. It was therefore the Romans crucified the wannabe king of the jaywalkers, especially using a horizontal and a vertical component to nail the wannabe king. So here you see the Roman, here you see Mr. Inri. And here it says, the horizontal rule, Roman Republic, here yeah, the Roman, crucified their vertical rule adversary, the wannabe king of Judea. It's all about the internal war within Pharaoh's worldwide nobility in between the horizontal rule and the old vertical rule and the new horizontal rule. It's the war between the reds and the whites. That's why the Pope is doing the sign of the cross. First, you do the vertical, then the horizontal. With your two fingers, 
You do the vertical from up to downwards, just as the vertical rule goes from the pharaonic ruler down to his subjects, and then the horizontal from left to right, as every horizontal republic has a left wing and a right wing. And it even says so in the Bible that Mr. Inri was out of the house of King David, thus officially entitled to be the genuine king of the Jaywalkers. And the whole thing is like Game of Thrones. Here it says Game of Thrones, and it's all about kings and pharaohs, you know. Here's the genealogy of Mr. Jesus at the end, and it starts with Adam, and then you've got Abraham here, and here's David, which is King David. It's a king, and one of his sons is Solomon. And from the other side, you know, you got at the end, you got Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then him here. So he goes. It's the same lineage of these kings, David, and all of this, you know. So it is Game of Thrones, really. And it's all about the, you know, I, I told you so, that all religion is about internal power games within Pharaoh's nobility, between the traditional vertical rule and the new revolutionary Republican horizontal room. It is Game of Thrones. What is the real problem in Korea between North and South? Do the people have a problem with each other? No. The North and South Koreans speak the same language. It's the same people. And even entire families have been broken up through the separation. Well, then what is the problem if it's not the people themselves having a problem with each other? Well, then the problem must be their masters, right? I'll tell you where the problem lies. South Korea is a horizontal rule republic of the NWO system. Whereas North Korea is a vertical rule OWO feudal system led by one man at the top of the pyramid. And that's why South Korea is with the USA, which is the biggest and most powerful horizontal rule in the world. Whereas North Korea incorporates the feudal vertical rule by this fat pharaoh on the right-hand side, who speaks Swiss German, gobbles Swiss cheese away as if he were not Asian at all, which in fact he isn't. Only pharaoh's nobility can organize this and be so organized to rule an entire country. So Kim Jong-un and his entire clan are, of course, pure pharaoh, pharaoh's nobility, who stick by the old pharaonic ruling system of the vertical feudal rule. Whereas the South Korean pharaonic rulers adopted the revolutionary new system of the republican horizontal rule. And that's why South Korea is in the same group as America, the JJ Bays, and Western Europe. Whereas North Korea has teamed up with the Arabic nobility, who want the vertical rule caliphate back. Therefore, North Korea is with China, which is a communist vertical rule. Therefore, North Korea is with Iran, which is a religious vertical rule. And North Korea has traditionally 
always been with communist Russia under Stalin, a communist vertical rule. And now with Mr. Lily Putin, also a vertical rule led by one man with, of course, also an entire clan and vast vertical rule organization behind. So here you can see on the left hand side countries that support Hamas. Well, what countries do you have here? It says Iran, Russia, Syria, China, North Korea. And all of these countries, they are vertical rule, just like Hamas, the caliphate, remember? Sham. It's an anagram for Sham, the same letters as Hamas. So Iran is a vertical religious rule. Russia is again a vertical dictatorship, communist again. And Syria is a dictatorship, it's a vertical rule. China is a communist dictatorship, a vertical rule, and North Korea as well. On the other side, the countries that support the JJ base. Due to the censorship, I'm not allowed to pronounce this word apparently, otherwise my film get taken off. So United States is a horizontal rule. It's Republican and as they say, democratic which is the same. Well, the democracy is what they do, and the republic is where they do it. It's the same as these Americans, they have the, you know, Republicans and Democrats. Well, Democrats is what they do, and Republicans is where they do it, which is basically the same thing. Ukraine, well, they want a horizontal rule, and they have that, apparently. They don't want to live anymore under a vertical communist dictatorship. Germany, it used to be a vertical rule with the emperor, with the German nobility, but now it is a horizontal rule. Well, France, that's where the idea of the, the horizontal rule in Europe, where it started with Marquis de Lafayette, the Knights Templars. United Kingdom, it is a um, constitutional monarchy. And with, to, with the uh, the Order of the Garter, they make a uh, an alliance, a compromise between horizontal and vertical. So that's why the United Kingdom, I call it a, um, they can flip any moment. It's a flipper country, which we see with um, King um, King Charles Al Windsor bin Arabia going to all these, you know, dressing up like. Uh, like in the caliphate, what he really wants, you know, of course. So, on one side, as I've been telling you, you know, the world is dividing into vertical rule on the left-hand side and horizontal rule on the right-hand side. You've got the Gestapo man, the Swiss Gestapo man. He speaks Swiss German, eating Swiss cheese, went to a Swiss school and... Like all the aristocracy, they all go to an expensive Swiss boarding school, like, you know. Well, you went to a normal school, actually, but, uh, but in Switzerland. So, it's not a coincidence that all the vertical rule countries are supporting uh, Sham, Hamas. All the horizontal countries, they are supporting the JJ base, because this is the world, how the world is being divided up. And this is why we have world wars and a third one coming up. Russia is, of course, a flipper, flipping over from Stalin's communism to a pretended democracy horizontal rule in the 1990s and early 2000s to back to a vertical rule feudal dictatorship in 2022 with the Ukraine war. Russia played America and Europe out by pretending to be a horizontal republic only to gain wealth, to gather the West's scientific progress concerning arms technology and thus to gain power. Another potential flipper is Japan, 
where the Jap nobility would like to reinstall the empire back on the throne for the vertical rule, flipping from horizontal to vertical again. And of course, North and South Vietnam was the same problem, where all local pharaohs who want to rule horizontally team up with America. And the other local pharaohs who want to rule vertically team up with communist um, dictatorships, vertical rules, or with the caliphate, vertical rule. People have no idea what it's about. Neither these ones, neither Russians, neither Chinese, neither the the, uh, the jaywalkers or the philistines they have no clue that all these wars are just wars in between pharaohs who want a vertical rule and other pharaohs who want the new horizontal rule countries that can flip over any moment are turkey egypt jordan japan and england all having their pharaonic masters to reinstall the vertical rule feudal system. Of course, Britain's first step towards this goal was the Brexit, where Britain left the European community back to the isolationism of the insular feudal empire. Here, England betrayed America and Europe, just as Lily Putin did, and merely pretending in order to gain wealth and power. So here you see it says Brexit, here's Europe. You see how it's loaded, you know, the vessel, you know, they gained a lot of wealth, just like Putin did. It's the same thing. Here it says Brexit, make Britain empire again. And the empire is the vertical rule. The European community is very horizontal. You know, you're not ruling alone anymore. You know, it's horizontal. That all all peoples from all the European countries are in in Strasbourg and Brussels, and they rule together, which is horizontal. So this is what's going on. And Putin, he did the same thing. You know, making using the European community to gain wealth. Britain did exactly the same thing. And then they left. And, you know, in order to become uh, vertical again. Now you will see the same thing happening in, uh, with, uh, in, in England. And, but then this vertical rule is going to be a caliphate. And Brexit was the first step. Here's what it says, make Britain empire again. It's exactly what it is. Pharaoh's nobility rules the entire world, whether they are horizontal pharaohs or vertical pharaohs. But they just have that internal quarrel over it about exactly how to rule. And Switzerland is Pharaoh's base for both the vertical rulers as well as the horizontal rulers. It's the neutral base of the master race. And here you see, a few weeks ago in February 2024, in the JJ base, they're all walking around with Swiss flags because uh, Switzerland banned uh, Hamas for five years. It says in the uh, J. Walker letters here, in the um, J.J. Bays, as you can see the flags here and here and here. And here it says, we love, and then you get the Swiss cross, we love Switzerland. Well, God's chosen people, they're quite blind because they can't see how they're getting duped and how they're being fooled by the Swissies who financed Hamas, who invited them into parliament. You know, it's just a very smart move, you know, to ban them and only for five years, you know. I mean, 
the Swiss has done everything they needed to do, and it doesn't have any more meaning to ban them now, you know, it doesn't make any more difference, you know. So here you see the whole street, you know, full of Swiss flags, and God's chosen, they apparently, they've got a short memory as well, they don't remember how Hitler's gold went to Switzerland, how Hitler was in Switzerland, in the uh, Villa Schoenberg, and uh, how the Nazis were financed out of Switzerland. You know. uh, I don't think God's chosen will ever open up their eyes, you know. I don't think so. And how else other than through the vertical and horizontal system can you explain that Germany and Japan teamed up in World War II? Two civilizations so far away from each other that had absolutely nothing in common. Well, both the Emperor of Germany, William II, and the Emperor Hirohito of Japan wanted their vertical rule back of an all powerful aristocratic feudal system, both in Japan and in Germany. And here today, you can even see them together. You know, the Japs with uh, swastika flags and uh, the flag of the rising sun. And they're fighting in the Ukraine as well, which is kind of weird because uh, Ukraine wants the horizontal rule, a, a, a Republican democracy. And this is the flag of the empire. So, well, these guys don't even know what's going on, you know. And um, so, of course, the sun, you know, this is the rising sun. What is this? Well, it's Amun-Ra. It's Ra, the sun god. It's Pharaonic, as I told you. The entire nobility of the entire world, they are pharaohs, you know. It's the same thing as in ancient Egypt. And this is why, you know, the Japs and the Germans, you know, with completely different civilization, you know, the, the people never had any friends, you know, and like Germans didn't have any Japanese friends and Japs didn't know any Germans personally. So how, the, how did it happen? Well, it's our masters who made it happen, you know, because they both know they are of pharaonic descent. And, and the dumb slaves, you know, they're doing this today, you know, the same teaming up Germany with the empire. So this is the flag of the empire, you know, and this at that time was the German empire. So this is the rising sun, it's Amun-Ra, and also this, I told you, this is a, comes out of a pyramid. Now just watch my video. So it's the vertical rulers teaming up. And this is how that happened. The alliance of Germany and Turkey during World War I, where both the Sultan of the Ottoman Caliphate and Germany's Emperor William II wanted to keep the old feudal system of the vertical rule. So you see the Turkish flag, the German flag, and this is apparently the Austrian-Hungarian flag. And here it says, Im Kampf vereint, it means united in battle. Well, they didn't battle at all, you know. And uh, you see the Templars cross, the octagon. Even the Sultan has a couple of a couple of octagons. Eh? So this is Emperor William II. This is the Sultan, and this is Emperor Franz Josef from Austria. And here, you know, you see you see them shaking hands, German with his uh, with his 
the sting on the on the helmet, little obelisk, the Turk, the Austrian, and a lion. Now why a lion, you know? There are no lions in Turkey, neither in Germany or Austria. It's a symbol of Pharaoh's nobility, it's the Sphinx. And uh, so all these guys here, they wanted to keep their empires, you know. Well, he lost it, you know, uh, in 1924 when Turkey became a republic and went over to become a horizontal rule with Atatürk, the Freemason. But when he was still ruling, it was a vertical rule. He had a vertical rule in Austria. Uh, he had a vertical rule, you know. And th this also was leading to the um, to the First World War when the Archduke uh, Ferdinand, when he was shot, you know, by a Freemason. It was the Black Hand. So they wanted the Freemasons wanted to have the horizontal rule, and um, and these guys they want to have the vertical rule. On the other side, you got all the horizontal guys, you know, like France, America. Well, let's say England, you know, but England is a special case because of the order of the garter. They had to become a horizontal rule, otherwise uh, all the royals would have ha had their heads uh, chopped off, just like in France, you know. So, and the people, you know, like Turks, and no Turk knew any German, you know, in this, and no German, ordinary people, no German person knew any Turk, you know, and, and, you know, hardly any, any Austrians either. So it's not the people behind all these wars, you know, it's so obvious. It's the masters and, you know, the lion. And we have to bleed for it. And this must stop. So again, another picture here where you can see the, uh, the propaganda of those days. It says here in German, Drei Kaiser Bund. A bond is a bond, you know, it's the same word, it's an alliance. But the Germanic word, or the Anglo-Saxon word, is a bond. You know, alliance is like Latin. And drei Kaiser, it means the, uh, the three emperors. The German guy, and uh, a grandson of uh, British Queen Victoria, of course. So the German pharaoh, Turkish pharaoh, and the Austrian pharaoh, they had a bond because they wanted a vertical rule against the uh, hor hor horizontalers. And this is what the dumb slaves have to bleed and suffer for. This is why all American presidents have always declared that the USA will always be with the J.J. Bays, always backing up the J.J. Bays, because both the USA and the J.J. Bays are horizontal rules of the Republic versus the Middle Eastern, predominantly vertical rule, feudal caliphates and emirates. And the American commoners believe that this alliance between the U.S. and the J.J. Bays is because of religion, and that the jaywalkers are the alleged good guys in the Bible. So the jaywalkers say to themselves, oh, we must keep the Americans believe that we are God's chosen people, so they will continue to help us. And even the Muslims believe the U.S. Jaywalker Alliance is about religions. Nonsense! The J.J. Bays is America's little horizontal baby in the Middle East, in the middle of the vertical caliphate. That's all there is to it. And this is also why Hamas on October 7th, 2023, murdered 20 Muslim Arabs and taking five of them hostage because this is neither a war about ethnicity nor about religion, but it is an internal war 
within Pharaoh's nobility in between the vertical rule and the horizontal rule, like two biblical brothers fighting with each other. By those biblical brothers, of course, I didn't mean the Philistines and the uh, and the Jaywalkers, but I meant the um, one pharaonic prince against another pharaonic prince. The first prince who gets everything, the primogenitor who gets the vertical rule, and the second, third, fourth, and fifth prince, etc., who wanted to make a horizontal rule. And that's why this guy here, the Hamas guy, he said, kill every person we see and come back. That was the order. And five Philistine Muslims were also abducted. And um, so even they, they say this isn't a religious war, but they don't know either what it's really about. Maybe the biblical story of Cain and Abel is just a reference to pharaonic princes fighting over rulership. Cain was the firstborn and primogenitor, therefore entitled to rule through the vertical rule, becoming the king pharaoh, while Abel had to become a simple shepherd similar to two poor Templars sharing one horse. Dear slaves, don't do their wars for them. Watch my video here, Warrior versus Soldier, to understand this. And here it's cut off, but I read it for you. It says, Mothers, raise your children as warriors, so the pharaohs can't snatch them and make soldiers out of them. I made it 12 years ago. You may also read it if you prefer. So this was the last part of it. And going even further back in history, does anyone really believe that this immensely powerful Roman Empire was founded by some Italians and their pizzas? The horizontal rule pharaohs of Upper Egypt, Perhet, White House of the NWO, horizontal republican rule founded Rome, which became Europe's first horizontal rule of the Republic of Rome, with the Senate and senators ruling altogether in a so-called horizontal rule, as the politicians of Rome were ruling together at the same level in the Senate, as you can see here. Therefore, in the Senate, having the facies, meaning one for all and all for one, as one straw can be snapped, but not a whole bundle tied together, which cannot be broken. So this means the facies is a symbol for the horizontal rule, because there are many that are ruling instead of only one in a vertical rule. So here you see the facies, the Romans here, and it has an X on it because union is force. You know, where we go one, we go all, which is the same thing. And the United States Senate, they also have two fatches in it. So, you know, one straw, you can break, you know, one corn like. But all together, you know, they're tied together with a leather rope here. It doesn't break. And that becomes a weapon, an axe, if, when you're holding together, which the, the people, the dumb slaves, they will never understand. But our masters, 
they fully understand this, and that's why they are victorious over the dumb slaves. So this became the way through which Rome became a great empire, set in place by the pharaohs of southern Egypt, called the heretic pharaohs. As historians falsely assume that the internal Egyptian war in between the northern Red House of Lower Egypt and the southern White House of Upper Egypt was about religion, which it wasn't. Just as they say today that the Gaza war is about religion, and in fact it isn't. The internal pharaonic war was about power and the ruling system of either vertically by a pharaoh or horizontally by several pharaohs in a senate. So here you can see the heretic pharaoh of the Perhet, Akhenaton, here as well. And this is when they invented God, or one monotheistic God, which is probably this here, or well, this is Aton. But there's only one God, that's why his name is Akhenaton. There's only one God. And that's what the historians believe it was all about, because they found all the, the other gods being destroyed, you know, with a hammer, all the hieroglyphs destroyed of all the other gods. And so that's how they assumed it was about religion. But in fact, it wasn't. You know, there are no wars about religion, really. It's all about the power and the internal struggles within Pharaoh's nobility going on until this very day. Why else do you think that all these Roman gods have a perfect Egyptian equivalent, which you can read here. It's called the Interpretatio uh, Greca. And if I scroll down here, you know, you can see them all. Like, you know, the gods, Greek, Roman, Etruscan, Egyptian, um, etc. So, you know, like Jupiter, the Roman Jupiter is Amun. Justitia, the Roman Justitia is Ma'at. First, I, I, I say the, the Roman one and then the Egyptian equivalent. Lucifer is Horus. Venus is Isis or Hathor. Diana is Bastet. Apollo is Horus, Adonis is Osiris, Minerva is Night, Atlas is Shu, Saturn is Knum, Bellona is Sekhmet, Aurora is Tefnut, Pluto is Anubis, Sol Invictus is Ra, Vulcan is Ptah, Mercury is Tot, etc., etc. It cannot be otherwise. We're dealing here with the same people from ancient Egypt who founded the Roman Empire, taking their ordinary people of Egypt with them, who became the Italians. Whereas the Roman elite are pure pharaonic nobility with all their demons, whom they call gods, and demons get mobilized by satanic rituals and blood sacrifices. This is how all the gods, you know, they got uh, discovered uh, anyway. It's all demon stuff. So here you can read about it, you know. You know. They all have the same gods, and the Etruscans, they, they, they were worshipping all these pharaonic gods anyway. And they were already there, you know, the ancient Egyptians in the Etruscan-like area. So, 
This is interpretatio greca or interpretatia greca. Very important. Of course, when Rome was founded, the local Etruscans literally worshipped Isis and other Egyptian deities. Then Rome got destroyed by the northern barbarians. And later on in history, the Knights Templars had to reinvent the ancient pharaonic idea of a horizontal rule once again. So this is what the world looks like and is just as in pharaonic times of the two Egypts divided into a horizontal rule here on the left hand side, the White House, and a vertical rule, this one here, the Pertasse. And that has led to two world wars and will lead to a third one that can break out any moment because of these pharaohs ruling over humanity. So the name of this one here is the is the Per Het. It means the White House, having a white crown. Like in America, that's why it's called the White House where America is being ruled. And this one here, the red crown, is called the Per Tasser. It means the Red House. And what we see now, you know, we see like America versus Russia. Europe is also part of America after the Second World War. And um, if you look at Russia, it's the Red House, you know, the communist. They got a red star on their bonnet, on their, their hats, and on their airplanes and tanks, you know, a red star, just like China and North Korea. And all of those guys in the caliphate, or who want to have a caliphate, they're having all Russian and Chinese and North Korean weapons. And on the other side, the horizontal rules, they all have American weapons, like the Republic of the JJ Bays and the rest. So it's just as in Pharaonic times, it's white against the reds and the reds against the whites. Nothing has changed, and this needs to stop. So here you see the red star on a Russian helicopter. Uh, this is a reference to the vertical red house of Pharaoh of Lower Egypt, the Pertasser. And Russia's dictatorship is a vertical rule. So here you see the flag of North Korea, the vertical dictatorship rule. Here you see the red star, and there's also a red star of China. Another vertical rule, you know, like camouflage as under communism, which it isn't, of course. This is all the red house, the Pertasser of Lower Egypt, and they had a vertical rule with an original pharaoh. So here you can see what that looks like. Here is the red house crown. So that's not a house to live in. It's a royal house, a dynasty. And this is also a dynasty. Don't you believe that Mr. Putin or Stalin or Mao Zedong or Kim Jong-un, that they are normal people, normal commoners? No, it's all nobility. It's all the nobility. And that's why they have the red house here, the, the red star of uh, the communist red star. But as I told you, it's not about communism and it's not about religion. That's all camouflage, you know, to, um, to unify the people under a, um, a um, common uh, denominator. Uh, that's what it's all about, you know, to... Um, identify so the people they can identify themselves with a symbol or you know so they are like one union you know like an uh, identitarian thing you know like all for one and all for and all for uh, one for, one for all 
This is what it's about. You know? This is Egypt this year. And this is the other side, the uh, the white crown of the White House. This is the Perth Het, it means the White House in demotic pharaonic. And it's a horizontal rule. It's the new Freemason Knights Templar system. But it's much older than that. Already in Upper Egypt, they had this. These were the heretic pharaohs. And it had nothing to do with religion. Just as today in the Gaza war, it has nothing to do with religion. It's the nobility. It's one pharaonic nobility. They want the caliphate and the vertical rule. On the other side, they want the, um, the republic, democracy, horizontal rule. But it's all pharaoh. And um, so this is the other side. This is the, the White House, the Perhet. So the, word is, the world is divided into the Red House and the White House, just as under pharaonic times. You know, I mean, we have not progressed very much, did we now? So this is how the world is being divided at the moment. This is the Red House of Pharaoh, and this is the White House of Pharaoh. It even says so, you know. And um, and the Gaza war, you know, it is like Russia's proxy war. I mean, they are financing all the caliphate guys because, you know, they want to destroy the, um, the horizontal rule of the JJ base. So this is the vertical rule. It's a dictatorship with, uh, you know, one guy at the top. And it's not about communism or or religion. It's it's all about aristocratic rule. These are the tsars, you know. And here you've got the other pharaohs. It's all nobility, you know. And this is a horizontal rule. It has a little bit more freedom of speech, or well, not very much. But um, um, I mean, it's it's the slaves, the commoners. They, um, it's you know, they don't matter really much. It's about the masters, the elite. You know, it's red against the white, and um, this is what it's all about. And Ukraine also, they wanted to have a horizontal rule. They don't want to have the vertical rule of these ones. I mean, I'm talking about the elite, the masters, and that's why we have these wars. You know. So here you got a whole setup for World War Three and also World War One, World War Two, the Gaza War, the Ukraine War, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, you name it. It's in between the horizontal, the new system, the uh, per head of the White House, and the old pharaonic vertical rule, the feudal system of the Red House. That's what it's all about, the reds against the whites. So it needs a vertical war to stop all the horizontal wars in between the people. So we really need to stop these punks here, the red punks and the white punks. We desperately need to stop them. Uh, well, what can I do with you, with you, all your slaves? What can I do with you, eh? And this is why I decided to talk about what is forbidden to talk about by the laws of silence, making me, in fact, a traitor. But I see no other way. If not, the masters will eventually destroy all life on earth. I would just like to stop all this because it's useless making these videos. It's absolutely useless. I would just like to make music with my children. But look, the music is sinking away in this Swiss swamp. Here you can see in the hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt a Templar's cross. And here the guy has a sort of a pyramid hanging around his neck. So here you can see it again, and even here. And these Templars' crosses have been depicted 
amongst the hieroglyphic depictions of ancient Egypt. As I've shown you in this video long time ago, that the Templar's Cross is a 2D depiction of a pyramid in 3D, and that the Knights Templars are of Pharaoh's nobility. So I made this video uh, 12 years ago on my channel, Hatzafats, here's the title. And I also made a remake of that video with some music in it here. I uploaded it two years ago, I think, on the same channel here. And I actually made the video uh, eight years ago, but as my other channel got taken down, I lost it, and with a bit of luck, um, somebody had um, downloaded it so I could uh, re upload it. This is much nicer to watch this one with some music. And also, these Knights Templars crosses are found in Egypt and carved into the existing hieroglyphs by, of course, the Templars themselves when they searched the notorious Templars' treasure of their pharaonic ancestors in the pyramids of Egypt during the Crusades, and then in 1291 brought their treasure into their neutral bays of the Master Rays in the Alps to found their Swiss banks with that. Now watch carefully this here. Here you can see it again a bit bigger. Um, people have been trying to prove that the pyramids in Central America were also built by the pharaohs. And when I was looking at this round thing with a hole in it and apparently attached to a wall, I immediately knew that I had seen that somewhere else before. Yes, I saw it on a Central American pyramid by the Maya and Aztecs, who apparently played a ball game three and a half thousand years ago called Ulama, and still being played by the indigenous populations in Mesoamerica. So here it says Egypt, that's this one here. And the very same thing here, it's as it says here, Mexico. So there is a connection and you know, this is obviously the very same thing. You know, I mean, you don't make a hieroglyph like by accident like this and it's accidentally like the same thing on another pyramid in another part of the world. So these pyramids, uh, to my opinion, they've been done by the very same people, the pharaohs. Here we have another depiction of the very same thing we also find in Egypt, ancient Egypt. And these two are both in Mexico. So here it says the Mesoamerican ball game. Here you see that the same thing as on the pyramid and as in ancient Egypt. The sports had different, different versions in different places during the millennia. And a modernized version of the game, Ulama, is still being played by the indigenous populations in some places. Here you can see, here you can read about the Ulama. It's apparently the name of the game. So we're back in the Mesoamerican ball game. Here's about the origins. And they already played it like uh, 1250 BC. So that's, you know, 3000 years ago. And of course, there's much more, but you can look it up yourself. And here you can see what the um, Mesoamerican ball game at the pyramids must have looked like. Here you see the ball flying, here's the hole with this thing here as well. If it was really for a ball game.
because I have my doubts. Maybe our masters made the rings here for another purpose. And since the rings were already there, some time later, the slaves and the, the people, they made some, something else out of it, since the rings were already there. I mean, why not use it? Might be funny, eh? Maybe they used it to attach a spaceship onto it, which is not even so far off as hieroglyphic depictions of helicopters, airplanes and spaceships were found from the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, as you can see here. Look, this one looks like a helicopter from the side. You got the rotor blades. This looks like a, uh, a spaceship. This is like a, um, a normal, a big, a big yacht of an oligarch or something. Or these prehistoric airplanes, which were found in Colombia, thousands made thousands of years ago. Aliens and pyramids, huh? Anyway, we're being lied to by our masters of Pharaoh's nobility, and there are weird things going on. For instance, look at these repto suits by the royal house of al Winsar bin Harabia. You think it's a coincidence that the repto suits they're wearing even show snake scales in the pattern? and that they are in the typical blue-green copper-based reptilian colors. It says repto suits. And look at the scales here and the pattern. It's the same as here. Here, compared to a real snake, you can compare the scales with the scale pattern on the repto suit. And it's the same copper-based green-bluish color. And look at it. It's the same pattern, the same, the same things here as this one here. You think it's a coincidence? I mean, everyone can smile nice and charming into the camera, but that's not a criteria for being a good person. I met very unfriendly people in my life who were very good persons. And I also met very friendly and polite persons in my life who were very evil. You know, like the sort of, you know, you're walking around in Zurich, Switzerland, and they'll say, Grüezi, Grüße, you know. But, well, but what are they doing behind your back, you know? Well, I know how they are, you know. So being nice and smart, nice smiling and friendly, that's not at all a criteria for being a good person, you know. Especially, you know, if you're like, if you would be in politics or if you're a spy, you know, this sort of things. If you believe a nice, smiling person like these two here with their repto suits, you know, that's, um, if, you, if you think they would also be um, good persons because they smile so nice, you know. That would lead you straight to your death, you know, straight to hell. So, well, I'm a historian, you know, I don't know very much about these sort of things. I can't even pronounce it because of the censorship, but um, I'll let you decide yourself, you know. I only thought it was weird, you know, it's the same color, the same repto scales, and it is weird, you know, and there are weird things going on, but. I don't know much about it, so I'll let you decide yourself. It's more like a discontinuity, you know, and something attracting my attention. And when the repto suit pharaohs were younger, they were surrounded by this guy here, by the name of Dr. Andrew Gay Lee the housemaster of Eton College at the time, who in every video is flashing out his tongue in repto manner, which I first showed you in this video here on my channel, Homeland Security. 
and about which this German made a fantastic remake when he discovered my video. And he was honest about it, you know, showing my channel here. Unfortunately, his, um, so here you can see the, uh, the guy sticking out his tongue all the time. And again, I'm, uh, I'm a historian. I don't know much about it, but it's, um, it's, it's a discontinuity. You know, it's, um, it's attracting my attention. So his channel of the German got taken down, but this guy here of this channel, he, um, he saved the video. So here's the title and weird things going on. And here are some examples of the repto tongues at Eton College in some additional videos coming up right now. So here it says Eton College. Eton sounds, of course, like the pharaonic Aton, the sun god Aton or Amun Ra. And here's the Fleur de Lis concept of three, because that's them, it's the side of the pyramid. And here as well, the concept of three. And look, even the, um, the line is sticking out his tongue. So Eton College is for pharaonic offspring only. And this is their coat of arms with a fleur de lis, similar to the royal seal of Ukraine. I wonder if at Eton, the little pharaohs play this pyramid ball game. Maybe they use human heads to throw through the hole and call it Reptoball or Reptorugger.